In this video, I hope to, at the very least, give you further appreciation for root planners such as those offered by Google or Apple Maps, as most of you probably have much appreciation for these already, and at most take you on a journey to the heart of math and physics by giving an introduction to measure theory and its applications, particularly to the path integral formulation of quantum mechanics. This is a big endeavor, and fair warning, there are likely several roadblocks that will appear, as these fundamental and rich topics are still very new and daunting to me, as they may be to you. Nonetheless, it's a journey I look forward to taking with you, and I hope we both learn something new along the way. Let's get started. First, we have to plan out our journey, and what better way to do that than utilize a route planner? Let's say I want to travel from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania to Hoboken, New Jersey. This is actually the journey I'm making in going up to college after a year of remote learning from my PA hometown. I'm sure you know the drill. Just type these two cities into a route planner app and voila, I'm given several options on how to get from the first location to the second. Notice how these options are all given for a particular reason. One may be the route that takes the shortest amount of time. Another may be the cheapest route with no tolls. There may also be specific options for specific modes of transportation, depending on whether I want to drive a car or take a train or bus. What perhaps is more interesting though is how the distance traveled usually isn't the main piece of information these route planners will focus on. It may seem like this is a huge disservice being done by the planners. After all, wouldn't trying to minimize the distance lead to more efficient travel? Ideally, yes, but in thinking about this question more deeply, we see that there are many other factors at play. For one, roads and railroads rarely allow for shortest distance travel, as they have to go around already existing cities and towns, mountains and bodies of water, and much more. But more importantly, people usually don't care about distance traveled as much as the other factors I mentioned, and the factors route planners typically take into account. People would like to get somewhere in the shortest amount of time, or not want to pay lots of additional fees for travel, or use the mode of transportation that's most convenient for them. These factors don't necessarily correspond to distance or length, but in a way they are generalization, a slight change in focus in which some ideas from the naive metric length carry over, but to which new enriching ideas are added, like time and money constraints or preferred method of travel. This may not allow for efficient travel in the basic draw a line between two points and travel along that line sense, but it does allow for efficient travel regarding what people consider and value when planning trips. Thus, one can draw a perhaps very unexpected comparison between route planners and measure theory. The latter also tries to generalize notions of length, or if we consider higher dimensions, area and volume. This theory seeks to assign, you guessed it, measures to objects. This measure is a number which gives a sense of the object's size. What's great about this name is that it gives a really good idea of what the theory is trying to do, but it still allows for that generalization, because we can measure various quantities of an object based on the tools we have at our disposal. For instance, if I'm trying to measure the volume of my luggage for my trip, it might be difficult to use a ruler or meter stick. But I could use a scale, and as long as I know the density of the luggage, which I could make a reasonable estimate for based on the density of, say, cotton if I'm packing clothes, I could still get a number for the volume. So you could think about the measure as giving a sense of an object's mass or heaviness as well. Let's stick with the luggage example and try to build a more rigorous definition of a measure. First, I want to make sure the measure of my luggage isn't a negative number, 
because something like negative mass or negative volume would be really confusing. Second, in starting out packing, I'd want the measure of my luggage to be zero, since my suitcase would be empty. And third, let's say I didn't want to measure the heaviness or volume of my luggage in bulk, but rather piece by piece. This should still be allowed, because I could add in items one by one, measuring each, and sum up the measures of these distinct items to get a measure for the entirety of my luggage. In all this, you may be asking yourself, hey, isn't this measure like some sort of output I get from weighing an input like luggage? If so, you've reached the destination I was hoping to guide you to, that a measure is, more rigorously, a function or map. The inputs to the functions are sets, very general and fundamental mathematical objects, with the output, the measure of a set, lying somewhere on the non-negative real line. We also include positive infinity, because while this wouldn't happen for the luggage example, some sets can be really large, to the point where their measure is indeed infinite. And furthermore, for the two specific properties of our measure, we have one, the empty set has measure zero, and two, the measure of the union of countably many pairwise disjoint sets is equal to the sum of the measures of each such subset. Pairwise disjoint simply means that each subset is distinct from all the rest, like how each item I add to luggage is distinct. And as long as we can count how many subsets there are, we can use this additivity property. These two properties are ones that all positive measures satisfy. But I would like to add a third. This is to say, if I travel from Philly to Hoboken with my luggage, as long as I don't lose anything along the way, the measure of this luggage in both places should be the same. The rigorous analog of this is translation invariance. Namely, if I have a set E and translate it by some factor X, the resulting value E plus X will have the same measure. This translation invariance is a key property of the Lebesgue measure, named after French mathematician Henri Lebesgue, whose PhD thesis, Integral Length Area, began math's dive into new types of integration at the beginning of the 20th century. Notice how the idea of length and area made it in the title of this seminal work. So we see another instance of measure theory being intimately related to and strongly motivated by these concepts. And the integral part of this, that's coming up shortly as a further attraction. But to give the definition of the Lebesgue measure as a map, it is one from a particular subset of the reals, which I'll label with this fancy B, to the non-negative extended real line that satisfies the three properties we've discussed. Now that the luggage is packed, what does our actual roadmap look like again? Well, first, we have to stop at a toll. I didn't select toll-free options in planning this trip. And there we'll talk about Lebesgue integration, a clever and more powerful method of integration from what you may have learned in introductory calculus courses, the Riemann integral. Then, once we arrive in Hoboken, we'll try visiting one of the many bars there and touch on the notion of what actually makes sets measurable, namely, what we need from our sets in order to consistently define their respective sizes. In the perhaps resulting inebriation of the bar visit, we'll encounter the random walk and use this to build up a definition of the path integral. I plan a great itinerary, don't I? All joking aside, on to our toll. As I said, we'd like to build up the notion of Lebesgue integration in relation to Riemann integration. I'll use a quote by Henri Lebesgue himself to guide this section. This quote was written in a letter to fellow French mathematician Paul Montel, and reads, I have to pay a certain sum, which I have collected in my pocket. 
I take the bills and coins out of my pocket and give them to the creditor in the order I find them until I have reached the total sum. This is the Riemann integral. But I can proceed differently. After I have taken all the money out of my pocket, I order the bills and coins according to identical values, and then I pay the several heaps, one after the other, to the creditor. This is my integral. Now, certainly, Lebec would have wanted to paint his method of integration in the most positive light, but this is a really apt analogy, as I'll attempt to show. Let's begin with Riemann's way. To compute the Riemann integral of a function over some region of the real line, we need to split up that region into small intervals called partitions. These have been divided on the graph using blue points on the x-axis. Each partition is used as a base for a rectangle, whose height is a value of the function over that specific partition, the red points. The integral is the limit of the sum of the areas of each rectangle as the length of the partitions approaches zero, or equivalently, as the partitions become infinite. Does this match Lebesgue's assessment? Well, if we think of the real line as the pocket and the function line over it as the coins and bills, then yes. We start by picking from outside the pocket, getting whichever coin or bill comes first, and reaching down more and more until we have enough money to give the creditor and pay off the sum. This gets the job done, yes, but we were picking things out of our pocket pretty blindly. And furthermore, what if there's other stuff besides money in our pocket? These are two major issues with Riemann's way. It's a rather inefficient breakdown of the area under a curve, and it relies on the structure of the real line to work. If other things were in our pocket, i.e. the domain of our function was something different than the real line, then we cannot use Riemann integration. What about Lebesgue's way? We still need area under a curve, but what we do is turn the problem on its head, in a sense, and consider first the function lying over the region, rather than the region itself. What we do is create simple functions, which are essentially contour maps of our actual function, giving estimates of the value of the function over particular patches of the region. We multiply each value the simple function takes on by the measure of the region over which the simple function at least equals that particular value. And then we sum over these areas to get an estimate for the area under the actual function. What happens now is we get a whole set of these simple function sums based on how we chose to estimate the actual function. Each sum is denoted using the integral sign and with respect to our measure. It can be any sort of measure, so we keep it as mu generally. Uh, to ensure that we get just the right integral without going over, we take the least upper bound of these sums, known as the supremum, and that is the Lebesgue integral of our actual function. This got a little abstract, but again, we can tie it back to Henri Lebesgue's payment analogy. In organizing the bills and coins, what we are doing is saying, to pay off the sum, I'll give you three bills of this value, five bills of another value, several coins of this value, and so on. So we're dividing up the sum based on the identical values of the bills times how many of each bill we have. This is the value of the simple function times the measure of the patch where that simple function takes a particular value. And for the supremum, one can think of this intuitively as being the no change payment, where we pay just enough to cover the sum, but don't go over 
by paying a sum such that the creditor would have to give change back. And what's even cooler is that since measures are defined more generally for sets, rather than a specific set like the real line, we can do this method for lots of new functions whose region of integration may not be numbers at all. And keep this in mind as we make our way to path integration. Well, I think we've covered a lot, although sadly I have to take a pit stop here. I hope that soon I will be able to make a part two of this video, which will address the non-measurability question and the application of measures to quantum mechanics and quantum field theory. Some of the stuff I made in preparation for this is being shown now. And maybe it's all well in the end that, as I finish recording this video during Tropical Storm Henri's landfall near Hoboken, I've dedicated a lot of time to the Henri who started it all in terms of bringing mathematical rigor to the idea of measuring things. I am immensely excited to submit this to the Summer of Math Exposition. This definitely encouraged me to step out of my comfort zone and dig into this format of learning. I didn't accomplish everything I hoped to, but I'm proud of what I did submit, and I hope it can be a building block for new things to come, both specifically in math or physics exposition, and more generally in my academic and life experience. As a final note, I'm leaving in the description several resources if you would like to learn more about any of this, as well as several acknowledgments to people who, rather knowingly or unknowingly, helped me a lot in completing this. Hopefully, we will see each other on the road again soon. Until then, peace be the journey.